and we are live in YouTube, please feel free to launch your event. Enjoy Thank your you. session. Thanks. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session on Global Environmental Commons, co-designing solutions to integrate SDGs into policies and practice through education and capacity development. Uh, the session is uh, jointly hosted by the Government of Japan's Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, Salitest, and the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University Earth Institute. I am the moderator of the session. This is Radhika Iyengar from the Center of Sustainable Development Earth Institute, Columbia University. Uh, we have been told that we have over 2,500 attendees. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A box to um, type up your questions. We will do our best to answer some of them. And I would uh, request the panelists to please keep to your time, 10 minutes maximum, so that we can cover the entire session uh, on time. And we are just moving on to the next uh, slide here. We have some guiding questions for the session. This is based on our concept note, which is up on the HLPF session five website. And it's basically focusing on the interlinkages of the SDGs and making sure that the policy makers are prioritizing these interlinkages and making SDGs their top priority. So how our panel should be able to address these issues as to how we can make the policy makers really focus on the SDGs and make them their top priority. We have a great lineup of uh, uh, esteemed panelists today. I'm very honored to be moderating this session. Uh, uh, this is our uh, structure. We will stick to our time and to be, and so we'll just go over to Professor Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University. Jeff Sachs needs no introduction. He's a world renowned economist and has been working as uh, advising for MTGs as well as for the SDGs with the UN Secretary General. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for joining. I know it's a very important time for everyone. So thanks for joining. Over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Radhika, and uh, thanks uh, to the government of Japan and to all of the uh, hosts for this important uh, session. I'm very happy that this is uh, about solutions, uh, about co-designing solutions. <laughs> We've got a lot of problems. Uh, we need to find answers to them. And uh, I have found in my own experience and institutional experience at universities and as director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, that the key to finding solutions is to keep your eye on the target. Uh, in other words, uh, solutions don't come through uh, uh, traditional silos or uh, traditional disciplinary uh, departments or schools or faculties at a university or by government working alone, or by uh, universities or business working alone. They come from problem solving, taking a problem and then working through how it can actually be achieved. Uh, we've got so many problems right now that uh, there's no shortage of things to do. Uh, obviously, our most urgent challenge uh, is to stop the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, and this is uh, one of those uh, challenges that uh, we need to face uh, in a co-design and uh, solution-oriented manner. Our governments obviously are not up to this, uh, or most governments. My own uh, has given up in the United States. We have no government uh, leadership because, uh, unfortunately, the president and his team are not competent to face a crisis like this. So we have 60,000 new cases yesterday, 1,000 new deaths, and an epidemic that's uh, out of control. That's true in most of the world's large countries, not all of them. Uh, there has been progress in China, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, a few other countries uh, where there has been notable containment of the epidemic, uh, but uh, uh, for most of our governments, uh, they're not up to this task. And so this is a kind of problem solving that needs to be done. Another example of complex problem solving that is uh, absolutely essential is the climate crisis. Uh, again, there is uh, partly a deliberate uh, misdirection on this crisis uh, uh, in the United States and some other fossil fuel 
uh, energy countries, uh, political corruption from the oil and uh, fossil fuel sector is so high that governments don't even want to pay attention to this. But the challenge, uh, even aside from the political corruption, uh, is very real. How do we move in a short period of time from a fossil fuel based economy to a zero carbon economy? We know from the scientific evidence put forward by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement objective of holding warming to below 1.5 degrees C, at least we have to decarbonize by the middle of this century. We have to reach zero greenhouse emissions by mid-century. Of course, we're wildly off track to do that. Uh, how many of our governments are even taking seriously that timeline? Unfortunately, very few, but the consequences for the world will be devastating if we keep on this current path, just as with COVID, we were told time and again that pandemics were likely, our governments ignored that. We're told time and again that climate change will be devastating, our governments are ignoring that. Uh, but even those that aren't need solutions. For many, many years, uh, I've been uh, urging and working with groups on co-designing solutions to get to zero carbon. My main lesson from this is do that homework assignment. Uh, if I were a professor, I would give you a problem set. Here is your economy. How do you get to zero carbon in 2050 in a realistic way? This is a design exercise. Uh, it requires a, a pathway for technology, for economic policy, for behavior change that by 2050, 30 years from now, accomplishes a specific but crucially important goal. You would think that the fact that humanity depends on this goal would mean that you could go look up such pathways in a library filled uh, with the uh, government reports on how this is going to be done. You would be sadly disappointed. There are very, very few such reports in the world by governments of how they will decarbonize by 2050. Because governments are not in the business generally of solving problems, they're in the business of keeping power. And this is a big difference. Uh, but we need problem solving. Uh, and problem solving is a matter of design. Uh, it's not a matter of academic research per se. Uh, it is uh, not a matter of publishing a journal article. It is a matter of co-designing a pathway to a real solution that can work, that is financeable, that is acceptable, that makes sense. But first of all, it is a solution to a specific problem. Well, the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement and COVID give us enough homework to solve. Uh, we have to get to zero on uh, greenhouse emissions by mid-century. We have to contain a dangerous uh, and easily transmissible virus. Uh, we have to uh, find a way uh, to ensure that every person on this planet has access to education, SDG three, uh, I'm sorry, SDG four, or access to healthcare, SDG three, our basic commitments, both as human rights and as the most uh, uh, basic sense for our societies to function properly. Now we have to figure out how to get education to two billion kids whose schools are not open right now because of the pandemic, are we going to write off a generation? Of course not. Uh, but then we hear, I, I say, okay, go online if possible. And then immediately uh, I'm told, well, so many kids don't have access online, uh, which is true. How are we gonna solve that? I'll be speaking uh, in an hour to uh, the telecoms industry uh, in Asia, and I'm going to press them on one point. It's your job as telecoms to ensure access right now uh, for every child that they are part of school. They don't know it's their problem yet. Uh, they're not uh, co-designing a solution yet. 
Their job, they think, is to make money with the telephone subscribers. But their job right now is to ensure access to digital uh, information so that in the middle of a pandemic, we don't leave a whole generation of young people behind. All of this is to say that if we're really going to co-design solutions, we have to keep our eye rigorously on the targets. So the targets, just to remind you fundamentally, are education for all children, at least through completing upper secondary education by 2030. Health for all, not for some, not for those with money, but for all by 2030. Decarbonizing the world economy by 2050, if we're going to have even a modicum of uh, safety. Sustainable land use and ending massive deforestation in the Amazon, the Congo Basin, the Indonesian archipelago, because we're destroying the habitats of the planet. Sustainable cities, SDG 11, for the 2 billion people that will be coming into cities in the next 25 years. And digital access for all, because we've entered the digital age. If it wasn't clear three months ago, it's perfectly obvious now. Without access to quality broadband, and especially soon 5G, it will not be possible to move forward in this world. That's a very practical challenge. So thanks to this group for meeting. Uh, I know that there are uh, more uh, 2,000 participants and uh, people from all over the world. Let's solve these problems together. Radhika, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Really a perfect uh, opening remarks from you, keeping an eye on the target. And we hope that our panelists who are joining in the first panel are keeping their eye on the uh, target. And we, this is our lineup for panel number, uh, table round table number one. And the idea here for this particular panel is to focus on policy makers and policies uh, regarding SDGs. We'll start with um, EU Commissioner Virginia Sinku, which is a video uh, just to give a background on his work. He is the Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries for European Commission. Before this, he was the Minister of Economy and Innovation of if Lithuania. He's responsible for the new biodiversity strategy for 2030, promoting plastic free oceans, contributing to the farm and fork strategy and has been an ocean conservatorist, conservationist for a long time. So really the right person to hear from. So I'll just switch on his video. He will be joining by, uh, I'll share his video. I hope you all can see the video. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development is at the core of the work of the European Union with its members. The European Union is fully committed to be a front runner in implementing the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. The European Green Deal presented in December last year is now also an integral part of the Commission strategy to fulfill this commitment. The Sustainable Development Goal 14, among others, guides my work as Commissioner responsible for Environment, Fisheries and Ocean. In recent years, the EU has overhauled the common fisheries policy with sustainability at its core. We have set robust rules to tackle marine litter, in particular plastics. We have made good progress on conserving and protecting over 10% of our coastal and marine waters. We can be proud of these successes domestically, but we must now fulfill our promises in international water. In these areas, that are beyond the national jurisdiction of states, these remote areas contain a rich biodiversity that we have only just started discovering, and they need better protection. These areas are owned by no one, and they are shared by everyone. So, crucial for our lives, they are in a dire state. Nearly 70% of the ocean is under pressure, 
due to climate change, pollution at sea and from land, as well as overexploitation of marine resources. Scientists say that we are approaching an unprecedented tipping point for the state of the ocean. We need to have the courage to listen to science and make game-changing decisions. It's time to act, and time to act now. In the coming months, I see three major opportunities that the European Union, together with the global community, can seize to improve the health and the sustainability of this shared global common. First, we can improve the protection of areas in the Southern Ocean. It would provide an opportunity to deliver on our promise under SDG 14 to conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas by 2020. That is why the EU has proposed to create two new marine protected areas, one in East Antarctica and another in the Weddell Sea. The Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources will discuss these proposals at its meeting in October this year. We must make it successful. Second, illegal, unreported and unregulated fisheries continue to be a scourge for the ocean, in particular in the high seas. They are also a threat to the jobs that depend on oceans. The EU has a zero tolerance approach to such fishing practices. We will continue to deploy all our policy tools, including international fora to fight them. Within the World Trade Organization, we need to eliminate all subsidies to IUU fishing as part of the broader discussion to eliminate harmful subsidies. It will be crucial to conclude these WTO negotiations the soonest with the SDG 14 target in mind. Third, for more than a decade, a treaty has been in the making at the United Nations. It is known as the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, or BBNJ Treaty. And it also referred to as the High Seas Treaty. When adopted, this treaty will enable the global community to take collective action to conserve and sustainably use the high seas. The recent pandemic has shown how much our personal health depends on a healthy environment, including healthy oceans. We will spare no efforts to come to a successful outcome at the last intergovernmental conference taking place in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue to be guided by what we have agreed as a global community under the Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals. We owe it to future generations. Thank you. Really a perfect way of uh, saying that the urgency is a lot. We, it is urgent, these matters are urgent as well as listen to science. I think there are two main things that I got from uh, EU Commissioner uh, Virginia Pinky, which is the uh, video. Going over to, um, I will share my screen again to my presentation so that you know the lineup. I'll go over to NEP Kathleen Shehu's uh, presentation. She will add a few words to the Commissioner's uh, presentation. Uh, just a little bit about uh, NEP Kathleen Shehu. She is a journalist. And uh, the best part is that she is a sailor who is the first woman to complete a round-the-world sailing race single-handedly and that to non-stop. And she co-founded the Ocean and Climate Platform and launched the Common Good of Humanity. Since May, to, since May 2019, she's been elected member of the European Parliament and we are really honored to welcome this courageous lady and uh, uh, really hope to gain a lot from her presentation. Thank you very much, Radhika. Uh, just be careful because your your microphone. I think you you we didn't he really hear you, uh, but I, I will begin. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone because. It seems that you 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 come from everywhere around the world. I would like to warmly uh, thank the organizers, University of Columbia, the Japanese MIT, the NGO Sulitest, and also Mercator Océan for giving me the opportunity to discuss topics that have been 
at the heart of my engagement uh, for almost 20 years, that is ocean preservation and more recently SDGs and the notion of ocean as a com global common uh, of humanity. My uh, first connection with the sea uh, is a personal one. I am a former sailor and I practiced uh, diving when I was young. Uh, the sticking memory uh, of seeing so many plastics uh, floating around the, on the ocean, even far away in the middle of the Atlantic or in the Southern Ocean were constitutive moments of my engagement to protect our maritime marine ecosystems. We only have one ocean connecting with uh, our planet Earth. It provides us with an abundance of ecosystemic services such as alpha oxygen, uh, food resources or energy. It absorbs a quarter of uh, GHG emissions and supports trade or tourism. The state of ocean and marine ecosystems, SDG 14, is representative uh, of the global status of our entire of an, uh, environment. It is connected to all the other SDGs and uh, what some people think are only land-based issues such as agriculture. However, in truth, our ocean is greatly affected by all human activities, climate change and pollutions plastic and pollutants, uh, whether they happen on land or on sea. The good health of ocean and coastal uh, ecosystems is a condition to maintain climate stability, SDG 13, but is also linked to SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, SDG 15, life on land, SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, etc. We are a few to promote the necessity of a cross-cutting scope, as it is shown on the illustration that comes from the French ministry. I don't know, Radhika, if you can show my the, the picture I sent to you. Uh, the, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the scoping, uh, the presentation of all the SDGs, putting the SDG 14 inside, in the middle. Uh, and um, I won't read the picture, so <laughs> you, you won't see it. Uh, just up on several interconnection. For me, uh, the first pass uh, to, yeah, thank you very much. You can see uh, the reality is that SDG 14 is interconnected with all the SDGs. The first path of, to promote an integrated uh, environmental approach was to promote with other stakeholders, uh, scientists, NGOs, institutions, private sector, the link between ocean and climate. Uh, so SDG uh, 14 and 13. This 8th of June, 2014, with the support of the IOC, the International Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, we created uh, the Ocean and Climate Platform in Paris to bring together SDG 14 and uh, 13 and ensure the ocean issues are integrated in the climate negotiations. Our goal was to speak for our ocean at international negotiations on climate. When negotiators talked about the green length of earth and how forests must be protected, they always forgot blue carbon things uh, such as mangroves, marine herbs and salt marshes. During the COP21, we won a battle. We obtained the inclusion of the word ocean in the Paris Agreement recital. And I invite you to visit the Ocean and Climate website and also Friends of Ocean Action, supported by the UN Special Envoy on the Oce Ocean, Peter Thompson. So now I will speak as a member uh, of the European Parliament who has been trying to, for the last years, year, uh, to preach for a more integrated approach on ocean is issues. In the EU, despite having an uh, integrated maritime policy from 2007, despite having our Commissioner Sinkevicius defending ocean interleakage, ocean topics are still addressed in silos. 
I am active in three parliamentary uh, committee, development, uh, environment and fisheries, where ocean topics are scattered around. And I could also be a member of the transport committee, but I'm only a woman, <laughs> a, a human, a human, sorry. We need more cohesion between the fields and for institutions to co coordinate their political actions. That's why I'm calling for an European ocean strategy in the Green Deal to bring together all those subjects. Uh, there is a first attempt in France as President Emmanuel Macron just nominated a French minister of the sea uh, at the, the beginning of the, of, the, of the week. I am convinced that Europe needs to lead the way to, as it, is, as it will also revive uh, from ocean. So to answer your question, Radhika, uh, decision makers often claim that SDGs should remain more than ever their top priority uh, to face the many sustainable development challenges, but they don't really speak about their crossing cutting scope. It's my feeling. And I'm convinced that with the COVID crisis, we have to promote this idea more than ever. Scientists have shown that sanitary crises are connected to climate crisis, biodiversity loss, and it has huge economic and social consequences. Faced with a systemic problem, we need a systemic a systemic answers. Uh, that's why we need to tackle all the challenges together. And my feeling is we always talk, talk about the, the SDGs as a goal uh, to reach, but we should use them as the backbone of our poli policies to facilitate an integrated approach. It's a universal approach used by all states, but also cities, private sectors as well. I realized uh, that when I went uh, last September to the forum on SDGs uh, with the, the European Parliament and was impressed by our meeting uh, with Jeffrey Sachs and with the Columbian University. There is uh, also another notion that we should invest on the global commons uh, to push states, private sector, cities, citizens to understand their duty on ocean. We have to promote the notion of the ocean as a global common of humanity. I repeat, there is just one ocean, which is nobody's property, but belongs to humanity altogether. We all benefit from its services and are responsible of its good health. The appeal uh, I have launched two years ago with other stakeholders calls to put no the notion of responsibility above the notion of navigation liberty in ICES and sovereign rights on exclusive economic zones. States received those rights by the Convention of the Sea by delegation, but it does not mean they are not responsible for the good health of the sea. With the Ocean and as Common initiative, our goal is to have the mention of the ocean as a global common in the recital of the IC Future Treaty. And we need your support. To conclude uh, and to complete my answers to your questions, uh, Radhika, uh, we, we don't only have to connect SDGs all together. We also have to connect people farmers and fishermen, for example, and of course, to teach the SDGs as it is proposed by Solitest. And congratulations for this initiative and fair win to it. Thank you to everybody. Thank you so much, Aniti, Kathleen, Mashebo. This is really uh, heartening to hear as well as uh, you really speak from passion and uh, personal experience. So thank you for being here and uh, sharing uh, uh, your thoughts. Now we'll go over to our next panelist, um, Mr. Jun Hayakawa. He's a senior officer for Wide Area Water Management, uh, Kanto Regional Development Bureau, MLIT Japan, and has a ton of experience, is a uh, engineer by uh, training, but has been working in the field uh, to uh, do uh, bioenvironmental conservation since uh, many years. So we'll hear from uh, Hayakawa-san. Over to you.
sorry, can you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I cannot uh, uh, push the button of mute. Okay, so uh, excellencies, distinguished uh, panelists, and then so many participants around 400, I can see. Uh, so it's a great honor to share uh, the policy and practice uh, to achieve uh, SDGs. Uh, tonight from Tokyo right now. And uh, I'd like to explain uh, how SDG 6, uh, because I'm chart in water resources management for metropolitan area. Uh, actually, you know, I'm preparing the water uh, for Tokyo Olympic games, but uh, you know, uh, postponed because of COVID-19. So instead of the Olympics, I promote the hand washing uh, by using uh, uh, water uh, in re many reservoirs of our metropolitan area. Uh, anyway, so, you know, SDG 6 uh, are about water, uh, especially integrated water resources management uh, by river basin unit uh, contributes all uh, 70 goals, I think. So I'll introduce uh, the our policy and experience uh, by uh, presentation material. Okay, so first of all, uh, let me introduce the history of the river row in Japan. So about 124 years ago, uh, this law uh, was established and uh, the purpose is just flood control. But after that, about 60 years ago, uh, new purpose, water use management, it was added and uh, uh, we started integrate. We started the integrated river basin management system by one river, one plan, one management. And uh, about 20, 30 years ago, uh, environment uh, was uh, added into uh, the purposes of river law. So we improved this law and. Uh, so, you know, please compare to the uh, river row, a basic policy and SDGs is very uh, close. You know, uh, we uh, control, uh, we manage flood, water use, environment uh, by uh, river row. And, uh, you know, SDG uh, uh, solve very complex uh, issues, uh, problems of economy, society and biosphere. So, you know, uh, it, so that's why uh, we uh, achieved 1994 uh, degrees of uh, in the integrated water resource management, I believe. And uh, like many countries, uh, we found many difficulties uh, to practice. So now we are trying to uh, strengthen uh, the comprehensive river basin management with multi-stakeholder partnership. Uh, this management will improve not only the river, uh, but also we uh, uh, water uh, storage or retention in uh, the catchment area, but also uh, sewage system, land use control, evacuation system uh, in the floodplain. Uh, there are so many people uh, in floodplain in Japan. So to, uh, there are various countermeasures. That's why uh, the multi-stakeholder partnership are necessary. Uh, so uh, we are river manager, but to, uh, we need to collaborate with local government or municipalities with managers or farmers or many uh, uh, organizations or peoples. And uh, 
before uh, I talk about the relationship between the comprehensive river basin management and SDG, I'd like to show the figure, the network or uh, interrelated uh, networks of SDGs, 17 goals like this. So, you know, the, on the left side, here are uh, original icons of SDGs, you know, and uh, on the right side, this figure made by Dr. Suwa Professor, Faculty of Education, Gakushin University, Japan, uh, shows each goal is connected to other goals. That means all goals are interrelated or interlinked. Uh, so when we see the goals uh, from SDG 6 side that include uh, the comprehensive river basin management, uh, IWRM, uh, SDG 6 contributes to other goals, directory or indirectory. Uh, this is a river basin approach we called, especially that we strengthen SDG 1. Uh, that means water related uh, uh, disaster risk reduction. Uh, SDG 4, lifelong uh, learning for environment and disaster prevention. Uh, SDG 7, uh, 11, sorry, 11, integrated and sustainable human settlement planning or uh, goal 13, climate change adaptation, uh, and uh, 17, participation and collaboration of all stakeholders in one river basin. So in addition, uh, we are now uh, promoting green infra infrastructure too. Uh, so if we uh, uh, implement the uh, green infrastructure, uh, we can uh, strengthen uh, the, these icons. Uh, for example, uh, the biodiversity by creating wetland or ecological network uh, together with integrated flood management. So uh, this concept is very applicable for every uh, country uh, that has uh, a river basin. So to conclude, uh, SDG, all SDGs are interrelated or interlinked and uh, the river basin approach will contribute to other goals, directory or indirectly. And uh, then green infrastructure through river basin approach uh, will strengthen the contribution of SDGs. Uh, these are river basin uh, approach. Uh, to all SDGs. Uh, thank you. So back to uh, Redga. Thank you. Uh, it's great to hear these really on the ground experiences. Uh, thanks for sharing your experience and really a pleasure to have you here. Our next panelist is um, Mr. Pierre Baurel, and just a bit about his experience. Um, he's the Director General Mercator Ocean International. He coordinated the EU research and development project, which resulted in developing a community of 60 European public and private partners in around 28 countries that have been focusing on ocean related analysis and research. And he's really a pioneer in this field uh, which is related to ocean research. So thank you, Piero, for joining and uh, over to you for your intervention. Thank you very much, Radhika, and um, hello to everyone, everywhere on the world. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you and I, I want uh, really to, to thank my, uh, my panelists uh, for the inspiring world that uh, that one mentioned. Um, and special thanks to Sulitest and uh, UNDESA for inviting me to, uh, to, to explain what we are doing. We, we are preparing a, a Sulitest module for explaining what SDG 14 uh, could do and uh, what it is. It will be illustrated by a few words about, from me and then Aurélien will, will continue, I'm sure. I'm coming from science. I'm leading an ocean forecasting center. We are forecasting the ocean. Um, I would like to illustrate here how uh, the, the, social, the, the societal responsibility of science and how we are progressively moving to a, a nexus where we have 
policy, business, and science together, thinking about the ocean. Because as Catherine Chabot has clearly said, there is one ocean only, and uh, we want to really to share the, this knowledge. I will share my slides and, uh, and give you some illustration of what I was saying. Uh, if everything is, goes well, you should see uh, the screen now. My screen, I mean. Uh, so my point is to, uh, to give you an illustration of how we integrate this SDG 14 uh, into the practical life and how we, we try to inspire youth and future decision makers about these uh, challenges of the ocean and SDG 14. So Mercato Ocean International, we are uh, an organization based in Europe, France, and uh, we are an expert organization. We are forecasting the ocean explaining uh, on uh, every day what is the, the situation of the ocean environment and what will be the situation in the coming weeks or what was the what are the trends for the uh, for the past we are very, very uh, working very closely with the european union uh, we are interested by the eu to implement the european marine service which means that we are working with colleagues with uh, uh, tens of, of, of different centers uh, in Europe to, to gather all the information and prepare this and share this information to thousands of users everywhere. So I'm, I'm very proud to, to talk today about this uh, EU vision of uh, an, um, the expansion and uh, of this knowledge and, and, and more than that, the fact that everything we do is uh, open, free, and that we work to, uh, to share this, this, uh, this knowledge very widely. We are fully connected to, uh, to the different continents. Our users are on all continents, and we are working with, the, uh, with UNESCO, with the uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, to connect with the different ocean forecasting centers in the world, share practices, share data, and, and be sure that uh, we are building together one single ocean. So um, one example of our scientific and, and technical background is the fact that our first uh, movement was to uh, build a digital ocean, to integrate everything we, we, we know about the, um, the, from the satellite, from the, 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 the ships uh, at sea, booze and mooring, et cetera, from what science says about 3D modeling of the ocean, so that we can uh, uh, explain and depict the ocean in 3D uh, with the blue component, I mean the physics, the currents, the, uh, the wave, the sea level, the uh, temperature, but also the white, explaining the, uh, what is going on with the ice uh, in uh, Arctic or Antarctic, that was mentioned by, the, uh, by our EU commissioner, but also the green where we have all the, uh, the connection with the, uh, the living uh, resources and in the uh, bio, biology, biochemistry, et cetera. And there is one, at the end of this, we have one uh, consistent description, one single uh, digital ocean where we, we, we put the best of our knowledge. And what happens is that this is um, then, it, it creates a situation where we have the uh, society at large coming to, uh, to play with this digital uh, data. Then we can say, uh, what is the trend of uh, the ocean acidity, which is the HD14. We can see um, science or, or, or policy makers uh, asking this digital ocean, uh, what is the situation or what could be the situation if this or this happened. One illustration and you have the logo of Copernicus in the middle. It means that this is typically the EU vision of this uh, flagship program, which is called uh, named Copernicus, is to, to simplify what is complex, the, uh, this, this information and to open uh, freely to everyone uh, this, this information so that then start the, uh, the knowledge, then start the, uh, the, uh, the, the dialogue between different communities uh, to, uh, from this, this ocean. So without Copernicus, we, the decision would be very different. One illustration of this, in, in one minute, uh, this digital ocean means that you can uh, really play with this, uh, with this uh, ocean and, uh, and ask about the salinity, which is uh, on the uh, on the left uh, upper uh, panel of, this, of the screen, but also the ice, the wave, the, uh, the temperature, the currents, the, uh, the coffee, and this is completely consistent. So talking about this SDG that are interrelated, the, uh, you can play with the climate, but the rivers, you can uh, 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 contribute to education. You can really uh, uh, 
process the uh, evolution of the uh, ocean acidity. You can explain what is the impact of illegal fisheries that we're mentioning, etc. And this is what we do at Mercato Ocean International: process everything and share to uh, everyone in the uh, in the scope of this um, of the, this policy um, business and science nexus. One illustration before to reach my conclusion is what we try to do uh, to develop ocean literacy. Uh, to develop the awareness about the ocean challenges and reach the, uh, the, the youth, uh, the, the, the youth generation, but also the policy makers. Uh, the blue book that is uh, on the screen is one illustration when we have society at large, at large explaining what they, what they are um, um, thinking about the ocean, why they need this, uh, this, uh, this, this knowledge to be shared, and uh, to explain to the other communities what uh, uh, what could be done together. This is uh, all about policy makers, entrepreneurs. Uh, um, this is um, teachers, uh, students, etc. This is this is an exercise that we we, we done at Mercato Ocean International with the European Union and uh, last year. The state report is the experts explaining what they know about the, uh, the ocean uh, environment today. You have this uh, this uh, the work we do with NGOs and uh, the uh, the. the um, you have Thomas on the screen, he's 16 year old. He has created his own NGO to educate his uh, generation to the importance of the ocean. And we have examples of uh, what could be done with muse museum uh, to, to explain and to, to, uh, to bring the, uh, the ocean, this digital ocean, which facilitates the, uh, the, the dialogue uh, to, uh, to the citizens. And this is why I'm very enthusiastic um, um, with this, this uh, the project we have with with Sulitest. I'm, I'm, frankly, this is something I'm uh, I'm very happy to uh, to talk about and, and to, to start. This is done with the UN DESA and with Sulitest uh, to uh, to build a, a module to explain what is the SDG 14. And so we're starting this. Uh, so you have uh, behind the screen you have everything I have presented, which is the fact that this is not only this SDG 14. This is an entry door to this digital ocean where you can not only access to all this data, but you can also access to other people. Catherine Chabot was explaining that you have to connect the uh, different uh, the, the different components of the ocean, different data, but also the people. And believe me, as soon as you have one ocean which is uh, accessible, and, and Professor Sachs pointed out that digital access is one uh, was objective. As soon as you open access, you simplify everything and that this is, these data are very, uh, that are serious data, verified by the best scientists, then something happens. So I'm looking forward to seeing this, uh, this solitaire model with uh, about SDG 14 to reach policymakers, to go to the European Parliament with Catherine Chabot, but also uh, to, the, to, to uh, the young generation with Solitest and to see what happened on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Varel. I think this is really perfect because it completely is in line with, with the EU Commissioner's idea of using science and believing in science. So you're actually implementing a science-based model. So that's fantastic to hear. We'll move to the next presentation uh, with Mr. Uh, Aurelien Dicom. And uh, he is the uh, General Secretary Solitest, is also an Associate Professor at Kedge Business School. And Solitus is an NGO accredited by the ECOSOC and by UNEA and develops online tools to raise awareness on sustainability literacy. I think this is really, really opportune that we have uh, Orion Decom, Decom to focus on sustainability literacy. This is really the need of the hour. So over to you, um, Orion. Thank you very much, Radhika. I will just here, share my screen so you can see uh, what I will present. Uh, it is a real pleasure and a real honor to co-organize this session and to contribute to this discussion. Uh, my name is Aurélien Descamps and uh, I'm an associate professor at Catch Business School in France. And as an academic, I've been working for several years now uh, to integrate sustainability into higher education and beyond. And in that context, uh, we co-founded an NGO 
called Sully Test. Uh, Sully Test today is an international movement uh, spread in 45 countries. It started at Kedge in France, and now it is used in uh, something like 45 countries. And the, the main goal of Sully Test is to provide free online tools to raise awareness on sustainability challenges uh, and to improve the understanding of the global goals and their systemic approach. So just to give you a few words uh, about Sully Test and where do we come from, and after that, I will elaborate on the, what we are going to do together with Pierre and Mercator on the specific uh, topic of ocean. Uh, Sully Test come from HESI, uh, which is the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative launched in 2012 uh, at Rio Plus 20. Uh, the, HESI is a unique initiative uh, bringing together different UN agencies and the higher education sector. And the main goal of HESI is to raise the voice of higher education and further education uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. So several actions came from HESI, uh, such as integrating sustainability into teaching, into research, uh, how do we decarbonize university, green campuses, the role of ranking and ratings, uh, but in this context of sustainability in higher education, there is a key question that Sully Test is trying to address. Uh, this question is how do we make sure that current and future decision makers have, have enough sustainability awareness, enough sustainability literacy uh, to take informed and effective decision? At Sully Test, we are convinced that uh, if we want to reach the 2030 agenda uh, and to achieve the sustainable development goals, we need to go beyond uh, those, those of us uh, who are probably here today who are already convinced and committed to the sustainable development goals. We have to reach out to the other ones. This is why our core mission at Sully Test is to build this collective sustainability literacy. Our mission statement is to achieve sustainability literacy for all. And this is why the first tool that we develop, which is our main tool, is a sustainability literacy test. The basic idea that we had is that we want to provide universities, but also organization, institution, or other organization with a simple tool uh, that allows to raise awareness on sustainability and to check that your students, your staff, your stakeholder have this basic sustainability literacy, just to be able to be aware of the challenges and to connect the the systemic perspective of the challenges to your own practices and your own job. So very quickly, how does it work? Uh, this test is an online test. It's a standardized test uh, shared uh, worldwide. Uh, it's an online uh, multiple choice question format. Uh, and uh, it consists of several different pieces, several different modules. We have an international core module addressing global challenges available in 10 different languages and aligned with the SDGs. And we have a matrix of topics ensuring that every time a session of the test is organized, we cover a systemic perspective of sustainability. So this is really the entry point and the first brick to build this collective sustainability driven culture uh, using Sully Test. In addition to that, and as the tool has spread, we have developed complementary resources. Uh, we have country specific modules because we know that some of the SDG challenges are really um, relying on a local context. And also we have started to develop SDG specific modules uh, with partnership with different UN agencies, uh, because once you have the big picture, uh, you, you are aware of the global perspective of sustainability. Uh, we want to push the learning further uh, and uh, focusing on specific uh, SDGs. And finally, uh, we have the, the initiative have been developed and has spread, uh, and we have developed the ability to customize uh, some dedicated resources to your own practices. Uh, and we have developed an ecosystem of complementary tool to develop 
gamification, for example, or to go a little bit further in the learning process and in the pedagogy. So it is important to say that this test uh, is available online for free for any university or organization willing to raise awareness or to collect indicator about sustainability literacy on, or its evolution. As we move forward, uh, Suli test is today an international movement. As Radhika mentioned, it is coordinated by an NGO accredited by ECOSOC and UN Environmental Assembly. And we have and we are developing an ecosystem of tools to push the learning of the SDGs further. So our main tool, of course, is that test that I just described. Uh, and complementary to, that, to this test, uh, we have developed an ecosystem of tools. Some tools are developed by Sully Test. Other tools are developed by partners, external partners and stakeholders uh, with whom we, we are building a partnership. Uh, so as far as Sully Test is concerned, uh, two interesting tools can be highlighted here. Uh, we have this test whose job is mainly to raise awareness and to map the evolution and the progress of uh, SDG awareness. And we have a quiz, which is an interactive game, uh, you more used as, as an icebreaker today, and also a pedagogical interface to conduct reverse pedagogy. The idea of this interface, which is called looping by Sully test, is that taking a test with learning statement, as we currently have with the test, is a good way of raising awareness and of being aware of the challenges, but being able to co-create uh, the question, the good question, the relevant question that should be on this test is also a good pedagogical exercise and a good learning uh, process uh, to understand the SDGs and their multiple interlinkages. So this is what we have currently online and we want to develop that. We always say that we are building the plane while flying, uh, meaning that we, ha we have launched this movement and we welcome a partnership like the one we have with Mercator and UNDESA uh, that I will uh, mention uh, just, just after that uh, to, to grow this ecosystem and to work on Sully test interdependence with other stakeholders. The main idea is to have an ecosystem allowing to go from I don't have a clear idea to I want to act. So we have tools to break the ice, we have tools to raise awareness, we have tools to learn about sustainability, and we uh, and there are other complementary resources uh, such as the SDG Academy provided by uh, SDSN or the UN SDG Learn uh, with whom we are partnering uh, to go further on your learning process and better understand the SDGs. And you can also use different initiatives if you want, if you have learned about the SDGs and now you want to act. You want to act in your daily life or in your professional life. The ultimate goal, of course, is to, is to trigger or to provoke this mindset shift uh, that everyone wants to act uh, to achieve the SDGs and the 2030 agenda. So very rapidly, where are we at the moment? Uh, the ecosystem of Sully test tools uh, are used in something like 45 countries, uh, almost uh, 160,000 people have taken the test so far. So we have started to raise awareness and to build this collective sustainability literacy. And we have two main stakeholders in our movement. One is a senior advisory board mainly with UN agencies and academic network. Uh, this senior advisory board is in charge of validating the content and uh, helping us to improve the tool over time. And as you can see on the map, uh, we have also 27 regional or national expert committees, regional committees that are a network of stakeholders in a specific country working to disseminate the tool in their own country uh, and also uh, to create the country specific modules. As the movement is accelerating, uh, we have more and more people using the tool and more and more people uh, and citizens taking the test. 
building this collective sustainability literacy. What is also interesting is that by doing that, we are creating and we are growing a first database mapping the evolution of sustainability literacy worldwide. So this is what we are doing also at the HLPF uh, in the context of HESI. Uh, Suditest is a contributor by producing a mapping every year at the HLPF of the evolution of sustainability awareness on the whole scope of the, of the 17 SDGs. So this report uh, is uh, available online on our website. Uh, HESI has two events at the HLPF, which uh, I encourage you to, to, to attend, of course. Uh, so do not hesitate to have a look at that and to have a detailed mapping of how the SDG awareness is evolving over time. And finally, what we are really interesting and what we are really happy to launch uh, today at this event is the fact that uh, Suditest is developing SDG-specific module. We have already several modules online built with different UN agencies on SDG 7, SDG 12, or SDG 11. Some are currently uh, under development. And as Pierre mentioned, uh, we will launch a module specific to SDG 14 uh, on Ocean uh, together with UNDESA and Mercator. The, the basic objective of this module is to raise awareness on SDG 14 uh, among current and future decision makers, to collect indicators on the evolution of SDG 14 awareness, and to analyze links and gaps between concepts, challenges, and knowledge, and their understanding by different audiences, such as students or policymakers. So I thank you very much for your attention. Do not hesitate to contact us if you want to join the movement. There are plenty of ways of joining the movement. Use the tool first. Uh, and if you're interested to contribute to these SDG 14 modules, you can reach out to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aurelian. This is really innovative and really the need of the hour. So congratulations for coming up to, you know, this, uh, at least, uh, uh, you know, where you have reached. I think it holds a lot of potential. And I hope to collaborate with you offline and we'll continue our discussions uh, soon. Um, and the, so now we, we are running a little bit behind schedule. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but maybe one question that is um, very dear to me, I think, is uh, this question by Monica. If maybe one of the panelists, maybe one or two panelists can answer this question. Uh, uh, Monica asked this question on the Q&A box. Uh, are there tools in place to bring equity and inclusion through diversity and raising awareness, accountability to our interconnected to the macro system planet earth through education incorporating formal and non-formal education to all stakeholders so basically she's asking uh, to how can we bring equity and inclusion um, through diversity and raising awareness about our planet earth by doing more of you know the education through no formal and non-formal education systems so any maybe one or two panelists if they can focus more on this equity and inclusion angle maybe for five minutes, uh, maybe two panelists, since we don't have a lot of time and we are running late. Anyone wants to go first? Well, if I may very quickly, um, as far as we are concerned, of course, this uh, equity uh, issue is really key in the sustainable development agenda. I think uh, what we are trying to achieve by building this collective knowledge base or cu culture of sustainability literacy is to have this um, systemic perspective of the SDGs. I think it's one of the major strengths of the SDGs uh, to, to bring together the, the, the so social aspect of sustainability with the env environmental aspect. So this is really key for us and something that we push uh, that our algorithm when organizing a test, you will never have a session uh, who, who is only environmental focus, uh, but you will always have a balance between problem and solutions and also between equity, so social and societal aspects and ecosystems. 
Oh, great, thank you so much. I think moving on to the other panelists, since we don't have a lot of time. Sorry, uh, is uh, Miss uh, Catherine Chebo wanted to say something? Yes. yes. Just, thank yeah, you. just want to to repeat what I was saying to. Yes. Monica. It's not very clear. I think there is a lag. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone is hearing this. No. I'm sorry, there is a lot of echo. Maybe I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you in one second and we uh, will go ahead and post. Is that all right? Yeah, sorry, not very clear. It's not very clear. Yeah. Maybe we'll go ahead with Mr. Bowen first. Oh, okay. Okay. Catherine, it's very difficult to hear you. Can you hear me, Radhika? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay. Okay, so then I, I start and maybe Catherine will be able to, uh, to continue. I just want to say that this is very, very serious um, uh, issue for us. So we are considered very uh, clearly the fact that everything we do, uh, we remove all the barriers that could prevent someone to access to this information. So this can be the, the technical access. This is, could be a sort of cost. So everything is free, the technical, etc. cetera. And, and, they, and we also, we explain the information because they, they level of information that should be made available. So first we, we uh, open a service where we, we treat everyone uh, at the same level so that we, we can uh, really invite more people um, uh, to this, uh, this group. And also we are monitoring what is going on. Uh, we, are, we know exactly uh, who's there, who has accessing this. And so we can uh, act to uh, re rebalance and go uh, uh, toward the specific uh, people, etc. And uh, the last word is about the impact of the of the COVID, which in this case is positive because then we learn to to do what we do today to to have a, a live session, a webinar, etc. And just give me give one one um, one indication. Before that, we were uh, uh, we had workshop with fifty people. And last week we had we had a workshop with uh, 700 people. It means that we can really invite more people everywhere in the world, uh, different people from different. Uh, uh, so this is really the society at large. So I think we are progressing well, but this is this must be an objective, and a very good question. Thank you so much, uh, dear. This is uh, fantastic to hear your uh, views on inclusion. Uh, we'll go over to our uh, second panel. I hope everyone can, I don't know if everyone can see this one second, I'll just share my screen. Yes, so our second panel um, is about practice. We've heard a great, you know, a great deal of policies. How do we influence the policymakers? Now let's hear from on the ground experiences and case studies, uh, which focus more on the practice of integration of SDGs at the local level. So we'll ask for Mr. Eddie Jorasaya to uh, intervene first. He's the director of systems and strategy of water resource management um, uh, at the Ministry of Public Works uh, in Indonesia. And we'll ask him to uh, say a few words about his experience. He has a ton of experience in uh, conservation, water conservation and water management. So we'll ask him to uh, do a presentation. And, and I'm really extremely sorry to our Indonesian colleagues. I know it's very late there. So thanks for sticking on. And next time, probably we'll have you present first. Uh, so thank you so much. Yes, uh, Mr. Jurasaya. Thank you, Radhika. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for opportunities given to me to share the knowledge about the interface approach to SDGs. In this occasion, please allow me to share the, about the directives and policies about Indonesia's water resources management plan approach to sustainable development goals. 
Indonesia is an archipelago with more than 17,000 islands located in the equator, populated by 260 million people on 1.9 million square kilometers. While the, the available water is quite large, around 4 billion cubic meters, the distribution is highly varied both in the spatial and temporal. The population distribution is also not well distributed and with more than half of the population live in Java Island. This condition added with climate variation and geological conditions leads them to more complex problem in managing water resources in Indonesia, aside from common problem of too little, too much and too dirty. We use river basin approach in managing our water resource where one river basin has one plan and one management. There are 128 river basins in Indonesia with 54 of them is managed by central government, 52 by provincial and 12 by regional government. Next. Although we try to have one plan and one management for river basins, which is mainly handled by Ministry of Public Works, there are many stakeholders and shareholders that are involved. From government side, such as Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, the private companies and communities. All of them deem to have the right to manage, consume, and exploit the available water resources, whether surface water, groundwater, and other related resources. The usage also varied from water for irrigation, drinking, energy, industry, etc. Without integrated water management, the degradation both in quantity and quality is inevitable. This is why we implement the integrated water resources management in our river basins. Next. The regulated, the regulated the water resources management in Indonesia, we have law number 17 of 2019 about water resources with the integrated water resources management concept as the main driving concept. The law has three pillars, has three main pillars and two supporting pillars. The main pillars are the conservation, utilization and control and mitigation of water hazard, supported by information system and empowerment and supervision. Each of these pillars have correlation with SDGs whether strongly or indirectly. The water resources conservation pillar, main related to SDGs number three, number six, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. The water utilization pillars, mainly related to SDGs number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, and 17. The water hazard control and mitigation strongly related to SGS number 11, 13, 16, and 17. The water resources information system mainly connected connect to SGS number 4, 6, 12, 16, and 17. While the empowerment and supervision uh, related to the SGS number 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, and 17. As a summary, we have integrated the SDGs in our river basin management with the water resources low and been trying our best to achieve the goals. Next. In these slides, we like to share the staging on the planning in water resources management for each of river basin in our countries. First, we create a strategic water resources management plan, which we call POLA. This document contains strategic plan that will be implemented in the range of 20 years. The making of this document involves all stakeholders and shareholders in the river basin, both from government and non-government association. The document usually has three scenarios of high, mid, and low economic projections to take into account the uncertain factor. The strategic plan then being expanded with more detailed plan in water resources master plan, which contain basic preparation for programs and activities 
and as an input to regional spatial plan. The master plan has the programs in the river basin for 20 years also. The master plan then is detailed into feasibility study in midterm plan activity and lastly the detailed plan for implementation. Next. Regarding the flood resilience in the river basin and correlation with the SDGs, we implement four stages which are plan, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. These stages form a loop back which uh, the evaluation is influencing the future plan. The planning stage started with gathering the necessary data. A good data is required to reconstruct a good plan. In this stage, there are already connections to several SDGs. The next phase is the planning itself. The implementation stage will step into the measure, including the construction or the non-construction measure. The construction implementation ex example is the building of floodway, dredging, and reservoir, while the non-construction measures such as community training. The monitoring step is commenced to ensure the quality of the implementations. The evaluation phase is done after the construction finished and the project starting to give the impact. The evaluation is used to improve in improving the future plan, whether the same, whether in the same basin or in another basin. Next. Regarding the drought resilience in the river basin, the correlation with SDGs, we implement two approach with our mitigation and handling. The mitigation consists of collecting data, planning for what to do, and the implement could be done by the community-based training, while the handling part is done by constructing necessary infrastructure to overcome, to overcome the drought by building reservoir, rain harvesting infrastructures, also groundwater wells. For temporary solution, it is possible to deliver water to the people with, with, with trucks or other measure in the drought area. Next. That's all that I want to share in this good opportunity. I hope that we can share and discuss further about these issues so, they, so we can improve the water resource management in our country and the SDGs can be achieved timely. All comments and suggestions are welcome. Thank you. And I wish you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Johar Saya. It's very, very inspirational to see how you've linked all the SDGs with the work that you're doing on the ground. So very, very fascinating. And I hope there are more officials like you working on, uh, you know, such things all over the world. And I'm sure they'll get, uh, you know, more inspiration from your presentation today. Our next uh, presenter is Dr. Andrea, Andreas Hutahayan. He is the Deputy Director uh, for Marine Conservation, Small Island Utilization, uh, the Coordinating Ministry for Maritime and Investment Affairs, Indonesia, and has been working in this field for 17 years, both at the national and international level on marine conservation issues. He has uh, a lot of experience on blue carbon and blue economy and is a pioneer in the field and is a negotiator of oceans at UNFCC. So we are clearly, we have a, uh, the right person in the panel today and Andreas will explain more on uh, the, in his Indonesian experience. Yes, Andreas. Uh, and just, yeah. just Thank you, you, Radhika. Can you can just, I, can yeah. you just on the presentation for 10 minutes so that we have time for this? Okay. Thank you, Radhika. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I would like to share from here, if possible. Do you want me to share the slides? No, I can. I can from here. Maybe it's better. Yes. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good uh, afternoon for everyone from here, I would like to thank to Radhika to give this opportunity. And now I would like to share some information regarding uh, one of the priority of uh, Indonesia government in the framework of combating marine debris. In this uh, presentation, I would like to link uh, not all of the SDGs, but I try to focus on four and 14 SDGs only. 
although in the practice in the practical uh, all SDGs are related in this kind of issue uh, all of us already we know that uh, that waste or debris is actually is a local issue is starting from our household household and now it's becoming a global problem not only in Indonesia but also in many uh, other countries in Europe or in US or even though the, the marine debris is already exist in the deeper water and in the Arctic problem. Uh, on 2017, I think there was a SDGs 14 conference and uh, I found this is a quite uh, important target is 14.1 is about the marine pollution and in this uh, report, they they mentioned that uh, what plastic pollution in the ocean is about most fifty two percent of global pollutant, and I think it's a very uh, important issue that uh, global in global framework that we need a common enemy at the moment, which is uh, plastic pollution, and and back to here that. In Indonesia uh, experience, we have conducted uh, some uh, scientific uh, data together with the World Bank and the LIPI. LIPI is Indonesian Institute of Science. We found that about 80% of uh, uh, leakage of waste come from the land, go to the sea, and 30% of the leakage is the plastic. So this number are uh, I think give us very uh, uh, important data that we need to remanage our waste uh, on land in order to reduce what is released in the ocean. So this is also not uh, on occurred in Indonesia. Uh, some study in 2017, uh, they found that uh, about 95% of marine plastic pollution or the bridge are coming from the 10 rivers. It contribute about uh, maybe up to 4 million tons uh, per year that coming only from 10 rivers, eight in Asia and two in Africa. And these are, I think this is the, our concern here that how we could able to manage our uh, land uh, waste management in land so that we could able to minimize the pollution, ocean pollution coming from the plastic. Apart from that, uh, I think I would like to share you that, uh, that our starting from that uh, scientific uh, evidence, we try to, to come with the problem, with, uh, to solve the problem by first, we have to establish our uh, national uh, law about combating marine debris. Uh, I think after work for 12, two, about two years, we finally established the presiden presidential decree uh, in 2018, so with uh, different of uh, what is uh, strategy, we have five strategies. Uh, but in this presentation, I would like to explain only the first and then the second. The first is about the behavioral change. This is more about the, how to educate, how to change the behavior of the people on land that they can uh, better manage the waste in by themselves, and then. The second is reduce land-based leakage. This is what kind of the uh, project uh, on the field that has been done uh, in Indonesia uh, at the moment. And what is the result up to now? I would like to show. Basically, the, the, our commitment that the Indonesian government commitment is try to reduce the plastic, uh, marine plastic debris by 70% in 2025. And after we, we try to reduce the waste using the three R, reduce, reuse, recycle up to 30% in 2025. This is the plan that we have uh, already would like to show you. One example of the, our national program, we call it Citarum Harum. This is, uh, Citarum is the name of the river. river. Harum means is uh, uh, not uh, smell good, something like that. So we want to, uh, to have the Citarum River have a good smell. So people could able to come to the river and enjoy the uh, what is the, the origin of the river with the good environment. Citarum River, uh, River Clean Up Project, uh, 
is located in the all of the West Java, and is uh, has the uh, long about 290 kilometers or more than that. I think you on the map you can see here uh, how is the the river uh, from the southern part of the West Java go to the uh, Java Sea in the northern part of Jakarta, and it's about 20 million people stay stay there and very depending on this environment, and that's that's why we need to how to communicate with those people that we need to make something better for the environment. On the right side, you may see that the, how is the changes. Uh, I mean, in 2017, we see it's very, the, the river uh, body is full of the uh, debris, something like that. I don't know, it's, I mean, maybe you can step on it. Uh, but uh, after a few months that uh, we, we are able to clean uh, of the river body in this uh, particular area. This is one example. And regarding the our action about the chase behavior, I think this is starting from uh, school. I think it's from uh, element uh, kindergarten as well and then elementary school. You may see here on the left side below, uh, this is the boy scout uh, bring the plastic bag uh, with the, some of the bottle plastic bag inside. Uh, this is some kind of like, uh, the teacher asked the, the, the children to bring every once a week to bring the uh, plastic bottle that they use or from the environment nearby them to bring it to the school. And then uh, the, the school uh, collecting them and then uh, using this as the material for the circular economy, something like that to another uh, West Bank, something like that. So this kind of uh, teaching learning is try to educate the, the people, the children, how they're able to manage the waste starting from the, their home, their own home in this area. And this is also some, another campaign that uh, starting from the high level of uh, people uh, and uh, I mean, starting in the people from the junior high school here in the blue one, uh, also try to educate how they could able to save our sea in the framework of the marine debris. So try to reduce the waste from the ocean using their own uh, strategy, something like that. Besides that, uh, this is uh, another action from the field that uh, this is how we could able to reduce the leak uh, land-based leakage from the Chitarum River. Uh, this is the Chisanti Lake in the upstream of the Chitarum River. Uh, now is uh, the important way in this uh, project. Uh, we also uh, ask the military or army to help us to clean up the 290 kilometer of river. So this is one of the important contribution. I think since uh, they have more power. Uh, physically and facilities. So we would like them also ask them to help to clean up the ecosystem or river ecosystem in this particular area. You can see how is the changes uh, from December to February three, by three months. I think they are clean up enough up to now. And now is uh, many people are stay there for enjoy the, the environment. Uh, this is also what happened uh, uh, before that uh, in the one area in nearby Bandung, in the uh, center of well, West Java, uh, how they clean the area before and after. And also uh, we are doing the rehabilitation of the river, uh, Starum River Bank. This is how that, so that the people can use the, the river bank for their activity. This is like a gym or, children for playing and then try to make a good garden uh, in once uh, in several points in during in the long of the river bank in this Chitarum river. This is also one way of the how we could able to rehabilitate the Chitarum bank in uh, river bank in this area. And beside uh, that, uh, a physical action, uh, we also would like to introduce uh, some of the, how the 
science and technology could intervene, give the intervention to manage the, the debris. Several, this is just some activities uh, that are already working on it. And this is using the plastic tarot. So we use the plastic, collect the plastic debris, and then we use as the material for the tarot. And then second is waste to energy. Now it's a, a big project in the 12 cities around Indonesia. And then plastic to fuel in the two cities. We already uh, deploy of this, including some of them are in the uh, river, uh, Citarum River. And also we have a good collaboration for uh, scientific development with the uh, ocean cleanup. Uh, to install this kind of uh, good machine for uh, pro uh, prevent the the marine debris going the no, the plastic debris going to the sea something like that. So using this kind of uh, instrument uh, machine, we could able to collect or to collect the debris before it they are entering the ocean. So uh, this is. Our uh, calculation, if we do not, uh, we do have some uh, study that if we do not uh, have some intervention about the marine debris, I think, uh, I think below you can see that we will have uh, more than double of the uh, waste in our ocean, something like that. Uh, for instance, up to now, I think our, uh, our debris or waste in general uh, Indonesia produced about uh, 65 um, million ton of the of uh, waste. So, if there is uh, assuming some of them are will uh, uh, release to the ocean, and then if we could not able to make some uh, better intervention, then including the technology intervention, we could not able to reduce to uh, to fill in the target, which is uh, reduce 70 percent of uh, marine debris by 2025. 20, uh, so this is uh, some calculation uh, conducted by uh, several institutions and together with the World Economic Forum uh, uh, institution. And this is what uh, our achievement. I think before I telling you that we have a uh, five uh, strategy, this is uh, after one year, we do calculate uh, what is the impact of the the target. I mean, we try to reduce the 70% using the five strategies. So this is our, the, the current uh, number until September 2019. Each strategy has uh, have some uh, uh, quantitative, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, result about how they could able to reduce the debris in this area, in Indonesia particularly. I think uh, Radhika, this is our my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. This is fantastic. I think you have done a marvelous job of doing a lot of interventions and behavior change related activities which are driven by common citizens. And I hope that all countries can do something similar. So thanks for that very inspiring uh, presentation uh, from your end. Uh, now we'll go over to our next presenter uh, who is actually coming from Ghana uh, and has a ton of information for us, Mr. Kofi Agboga, and he is the director of Hen Empango in Ghana, has a ton of experience in water resources, fisheries, coastal, and general environmental management, and is a chief of party for many USAID research projects in uh, Ghana. So thank you, Kofi, for joining and sorry for all the delay. I know we, have, we are slowly uh, uh, towards the end of the discussion, but uh, last but not the least, we need to hear from you and get inspired. Please take over. It's okay. Somebody must come at the last, so that's fine. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies and uh, all the audience. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. I'm speaking from Ghana, and I would like to share a few slides uh, with all of us. Whew. So I'm doing this with the support from, from two professors from the universities whose names are here. What I would like us to discuss this afternoon is to look at the West African region 
and then understand how the rivers are behaving and how we work on them. Kofi, sorry to interject. Now, we don't see your slides. Is it possible to share the slides from your end? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Click on the share screen button, the green button. Sorry, the screen. <clears throat> Yes, perfect. You're ready to go. Just a second. <clears throat> yeah. So, <clears throat> in West Africa, we have very large rivers, and we also have small rivers. So, generally, what I'm showing you here now is the River Senegal Basin, the River Niger Basin, the Lake Chad Basin, and the Volta Basin. I would like to focus more on the Volta Basin and then zoom down to Ghana to see how uh, the issues are playing out. The Volta Basin covers about six countries and it is managed by a commission or an authority. The major problems that we face in this area are land degradation, flooding, biodiversity loss, water quality, waterborne diseases, and coastal erosion. Now, waterborne diseases, if some of you may remember, the Volta Lake many years ago was the hub for the simulium, which causes river blindness. And for that reason, <clears throat> it made large areas of uh, the land in the basin uninhabitable because of these flies. But gradually with the support of WHO and others, it was gotten over and now there is devolution and therefore countries are supposed to manage the basins themselves. The Volta Basin Authority has developed a charter for water management and also making a number of investments to do reforestation and community improvement and the others. All these are related to the SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 17. Now, coming down to Ghana, we have a national water policy which derives from the NEPAD uh, partnerships for Africa and also Ghana's own poverty reduction strategies. And if you look at the Millennium Developed Goals, we can now talk about Goal 6, where there is a heavy focus to ensure that uh, water for all by the year 2030. Now, I would like to go on straight to how the Millennium Development Goals are playing out. I have to say that there is a very low level of awareness in this part of the world about this. Most of the time is political talk. Our leaders go out, they go to the meetings and when we come out, how do we transfer this kind of knowledge to local people on the ground? So the pictures I'm showing you now is the work done by the civil society, civil, so civil society coalition together with the UN community group to bring the SDGs down to the level of people to understand. So with all that my colleagues have shown, I have to show this to you pictorially. So if you look right at the top left corner, that is goal one, poverty. Goal three, well-being and health. Goal four, education. So. Pictorially, when you present these like this, 
people are able to understand it rather than just uh, showing those icons, which may not mean too much for our people who, again, I must say that because of the low education level, uh, it is difficult to get a lot of these issues out. Now, looking at the Volta Basin, there are a number of issues that uh, militate against the implementation of the SDGs, particularly Goal 6, Goal 14, and the others. If you look at the bottom half of the brown screen, one of the biggest issues that we encounter is the regulatory and administrative regimes, and for that matter, institutional weakness in implementing the SDGs relative to water supply in the basins. So if you look at Ghana here, we have a number of different basins and they all come with their problems. And if you put the problems together, what you see here is that it is the regulatory and the administrative regimes which is ranked the highest. And therefore, if this hurdle is not overcome, it will be very difficult to be able to handle other issues. Like my colleague from Indonesia said, all that they have done is driven by a strong institution that is working to achieve all this. Water pollution is a big issue as well as improper land use. Now, the policy tries to look at issues of poverty, socioeconomic development, cooperation and partnership, as well as environment. And you find all these in the SDGs from one to 17. Now, the precursors to achieving some of these SDGs on our side of the world, such as uh, improving water services, having a productive living, making girls stay in school as long as possible, reduce morbidity and mortality, as well as preventing waterborne diseases. All these are important. If you have not been able to achieve them, you will not be able to go ahead and then be managing the other issues that come subsequent to it. For instance, agriculture policy. Government is saying that planting for food and jobs. For that matter, they would like a lot of the youth to go into agriculture. In so doing, there is the fertilizer policy, but how much fertilizer must a farmer put under their crops? Invariably, most of the fertilizer is washed into the rivers and finally get their way into the sea. Some time passed, if you look at the slide I have on the left, the second slide, this is the beach, which is blanketed by algae, which is coming from fertilizer. Until you are able to reduce the fertilizer entering the rivers, this phenomenon will be occurring. There is a mining policy which is allowing small scale miners to dig anywhere and everywhere in the name of controlled mining. But invariably, it ends up in the illegal mining and all our rivers become brown water, what I always often re refer to as a, a, a cup of a milo with a generous dose of milk. Again, our sanitation policy, how much plastics are going into the marine environment? What is the kind of uh, uh, systems we've put in place to ensure that all these plastics are removed? Fortunately for us now, government has come up with a, an education policy which is very forward looking and that for every child of a school going age at the senior secondary level, education must be free. Now, when you do this for the next 20 years or so, a lot of uh, the youth will become more and more literate and therefore 
it will be easier to use them to implement uh, policies that government will come up with. Um, putting a lot of burden on government because uh, they hold the purse, they drive a lot of the issues that go on in the country. Uh, it is only when civil society comes in with funding from external sources that uh, we are able to hold government in check on some of the issues that uh, we're looking at. Uh, I have to say that, uh, again, SDGs are very low or the awareness for them is very low on this part of the world. And my suggestions are that one, we should push for integrating them into long-term development planning. It has to be reflected in most government documents and even at the local government level where the activities are happening on the ground, everybody must be wary of the SDGs and see how they are implemented. Again, I say that they have to be mandatory and then the implementing agencies must comply with the guidelines that are set forth. Budgetary allocations are very important and also monitoring of the SDGs. If there are no budgets for this, m and &E becomes something on paper. Uh, we have to practicalize it. Uh, the United Nations Development Program has an assessment tool that is used for assessing how well the local government agencies are doing on the ground. Uh, the SDGs have not come up as lively as they should in this document. And what I would like to suggest here is that uh, all these things must be re-looked really at and ensure that the SDGs are brought to the fore. SDGs must be a matter of concern to all of us. And again, it's not just going to be high level political talk where the kid on the street or the young man implementing policies at the local government level is not aware of all these things. Again, I have to say that uh, we should have started this discussion many, 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 many days and years ago. It is now coming up and we are asking government to show a lot of direction uh, to ensure that the SG, SDGs becomes something that is ingrained in the body politic and culture of our people. It has to manifest and be pervasive in our national life. The National Development Planning Commission must ensure that it is monitoring all these things. The local government agencies must have performance indices that uh, are related to the SDGs so that we can monitor them either in agriculture, in education, in the school curriculum, at the workplace and everywhere. In all this civil society, is called upon to play a very strong role in the monitoring. If civil society does not step, step up to the plate, then government will always have its way and then things are never get done in the right way. So again, I'll end up by showing you all these pictures again, how civil society coalition is uh, translating the SDGs in pictorial form so that uh, people can understand it in their own way. As they say, pictures say a lot than words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Agboga. I think really pictures are saying a lot and your presentation as well as the other two presenters in this panel have said that institution needs to be strong. So that's a common thread that has come across and as well as uh, civil society partnerships, I think is uh, need much needed uh, for SDGs. Maybe just one question since we are uh, you know, out of time, but one question from Adriana uh, and maybe any one of you can do uh, or you know, uh, answer the question. It's about specific indicators to measure SDG awareness or 
SDG um, knowledge uh, as well as practice. Uh, anything that you can share on the monitoring and evaluation of these interventions, I think would be great. Maybe in just two minutes, uh, maybe any one or two of you. Uh, yeah, Radhika. Yeah, I think uh, I would like to share a specific uh, target uh, regarding the marine debris. I think our I think on the SDG target 14.1 uh, is about uh, marine pollution, uh, and we are trying to link with the, our national uh, target, which is uh, reducing the marine debris by uh, 70 percent in 2025. Of course, we need to calculate uh, first how how much the waste already uh, uh, we have, and then release to the ocean, something like that, by using the modulation. And then starting that, then we able to uh, make uh, some action, uh, priority action, so that we could able to reduce by the time uh, of every year. We have some uh, what we call it uh, calculation. Uh, how is the, uh, the the progress of its strategy in order to reduce the the marine debris uh, to fulfill our national target, then SDG target at the end. Something like that. Thank you, Arika. Thank you, Andreas. Um, very, very helpful. Um, thank you for all the suggestions and thank you for all the panelists who have done a terrific job explaining their policy as well as uh, practice related work. I just want to uh, thank uh, Mashahiko Morase. I think he's there. Maybe you can say hello because uh, he's really uh, been the driving force behind getting the concept note done as well as uh, Cecil Thomas as well as Benoit. We have been exchanging emails overnight and have been working really hard to put this together. So thank you for all the people who have uh, you know, put this panel uh, together. Also, thank you to Harris, Ellery, and Naira from, and, uh, from the U, uh, UNITAR group to bring this panel together. I hope everyone is feeling very inspired, getting a perspective from the commissioners, getting a perspective from uh, you know, practice leaders, getting a perspective from people who are officials who are working on these things together to see how education and awareness can lead to all these changes. So thanks for everyone, especially the panelists who are there giving inspiring stories um, and inspiring sessions uh, regarding SDG implementation and their intersectionality. And we will definitely put up, there have been a lot of questions. We'll put up all the details of all the panelists, including their presentations and the video from the EU commissioner on the HLPF website, session five. And uh, definitely feel free to check this out and use the presentation, contact us. We are all approachable and thanks for uh, listening patiently uh, to all the presentations. Thank you all. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you so much.